how's it going everyone? Thanks for clicking on the video. I'm so glad that you're here. Your presence says something. Thanks for joining us for lesson one of Adolescence, Technology, and Parenting. In fact, as I was prepping for this, I asked myself a simple question. Why am I doing this? I mean, when I first said yes to God's calling as a youth minister, I didn't get into it just to hang out with teenagers eating pizza. But it became clearer than ever that spending time with parents is an essential part to this ministry. So let's set the table as to why we're here today. There are five assumptions that I'm making about what's bringing us together during these three sessions we'll be spending in these videos. One, I believe you love your kids. I believe that your kids are your most prized and valued resource. Don't get me wrong. I know they absolutely drive you nuts at times. Okay, maybe most of the time, but when it gets down to it, you love them deeply. Two, we love your kids. We at the Germantown Youth Group absolutely join you in those feelings. We believe the next generation is amazing. Sure, they drive us nuts sometimes. Okay, maybe a lot of times, but we adore your kids. Third, we want your kids to encounter Jesus. You could define success in parenting in a lot of different ways, but I believe for most of us, your greatest hope is that your students will be following Jesus five, 10, 25 years from now, and that's our hope too. Four, parenting is rough. In fact, I think there's no rougher job in the world. It is absolutely confounding that God would entrust us with such a task, isn't it? And then five, the current world of technology is overwhelming. Things are changing and developing rapidly, and it's nothing like when we were kids. I think for a lot of us, we're experiencing a mix of emotions. For some, it's confusion to fear, or maybe even cluelessness. And ultimately, we're just feeling overwhelmed. And although I don't think that these sessions and these videos will give you all the answers, I do hope that they'll give you some, and in the process, breathe life and hope into you. So now it's time for a disclaimer. I am not here to tell you how to parent. I simply hope to give you some information and thoughts that will help you shape your parenting of your teens. Now, I may give you my opinion at some points, but I'll try to be clear when this happens. I personally have three kids, and we're leaning into this stuff in our home. We're overwhelmed, and we're far from having all the answers. At the same time, my kids aren't teenagers, so I'm not going to assume that I know what you're going through. What I have is over a decade of youth ministry experience talking and dealing with parents and teenagers, and I've seen trends that I want to pass on to you. I believe in a community as large as ours, there's enough collective thoughts and ambitions to make a great parent. In fact, in the comments down below, write something your family has discovered as a valuable tool, tip, method, or idea when it comes to your family engaging with technology. We're going to call these parent hacks. So what is a hack? It's any trick, skill, or novelty method that increases productivity and efficiency in all walks of life. So no matter how simple you might think your parenting hack is when it comes to technology, type yours in the comments down below in order to share encouragement with another parent. Now that we have some of the groundwork laid, I'd like to take the rest of this video for us to try and wrap our minds around the current digital reality and then make some time to lean into what those implications are for us today. You know, I did a Google research of technology in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, filling in each of those decades, and here's what I've discovered. I think you'll find the results interesting. In the 80s, top technology came up, VCR, personal computer, Polaroids, a corded phone, and the Nintendo Entertainment System. In the 90s, AOL and dial-up internet showed up, Palm Pilots, flip phones, laptop computers, and the Discman. And then the early 2000s, MySpace, iPod, flat screen TVs, Xbox, digital camera, GPS, and texting. For us watching this video, these are the times when we came of age. In 2007, there came a significant moment when Steve Jobs introduces the world to the iPhone for the very first time. It was a sort of digital watershed moment that many say we will measure our current cultural time from life before iPhones or smartphones, and then life after the iPhone or smartphone. If you've never seen the clip before, it's worth a watch. I've included the first three and a half minutes here in a moment of the presentation, but it provided a link to the full video down below. If you don't care to watch this, go ahead and jump to the timestamp shown right here. This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years.
every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. And Apple has been, well, first of all, one's very fortunate if you get to work on just one of these in your career. Apple's been very fortunate. It's been able to introduce a few of these into the world. In 1984, we introduced the Macintosh. It didn't just change Apple. It changed the whole computer industry. In 2001, we introduced the first iPod. And it didn't, just, it didn't just change the way we all listen to music. It changed the entire music industry. Well, today, we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. The first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. So, three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod. A phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. And here it is. <laughs> no. Actually, here it is, but we're going to leave it there for now. So, before we get into it, let me. Uh, let me talk about a category of things. The most advanced phones are called smartphones. So Here is what makes this moment in history so significant. All the technology we just covered from the previous three decades is now accessible in that one single device. Post-2007, we all began carrying around supercomputers in our pockets. This adequately sums up the fact that we're all living in a new digital reality. So let's be clear about something. A smartphone or any technology is neither inherently evil or inherently good. It's a lot like a knife, right? A knife can be used for some very productive things like cutting bread, uh, spreading butter, or whittling. It can also be used for some very destructive things like slashing tires or even murder. The usage is determined by the user and his or her ability to discern proper and productive usage. This truth brings us to some things to consider right away when it comes to technology, especially smartphones, and our kids, like the age and the need for instruction and supervision. Now, I'm not going to give you a specific age that you should allow your kid to have an iPhone or smartphone, uh, an Instagram, TikTok, or Snapchat account, an Xbox, or even fill in the blank with whatever else, right? Maturity and readiness has factors beyond the amount of years on this earth. And that's going to take a lot of discernment and assessment from your end to determine. I will say, and here is my opinion, I think we as a culture are putting smartphones into our kids' hands at a far younger age than we ought to. But again, these things are not evil in among themselves. In fact, I would go so far as to say technology is a gift from God. Some examples, 
Well, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube changed the way I've been able to stay connected with students and parents during this social distancing that just recently went into place. I've also been able to use Zoom video conference calls to connect with our small group from church. And I'm able to make and send out this video today because of technology. This stuff is amazing, and we need to be thinking of ways that we can use it to advance the kingdom of God. But at the same time, we need to recognize that there are implications to the technology that we're using. There was a news article that showed up all over the place in November of 2017. The news article headline read, Facebook's first president on Facebook. God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. Now I'll link that article down below, but the article starts off saying, the Facebook founders purposefully created something addictive. The social network's first president told Axios in an interview, God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains, Sean Parker said in the interview published Thursday. Here are a couple other quotes from the article. I don't know if I really understood the consequences of what I was saying, because the unintended consequence of a network when it grows to a billion or two billion people, and it, it literally changes your relationship with society, with each other. It probably interferes with, productiv with productivity in weird ways, Parker said. When helping Facebook get off the ground in 2004, Parker said, he and others involved in the nascent social network thought, how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible? And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. And that's what's going to get you to contribute more content. And that's going to get you more likes and more comments. So as we try to assess how this stuff is affecting us, let's walk through a few points that will help us catch what is unique about this time that our kids are growing up in compared to when we grew up. First, the current digital reality gives us constant connection. Because we now are able to carry around supercomputers in our hands, we're always connected. And you might think that I'm using that word in a hyperbolic sense, but it's not that far from the truth. Check out these statistics from a common sense media survey of in 2019. I'll include that survey in a link to the article down below. Here the information tells us, among teens the amount of time dedicated to several individual screen activities inched up by 42 minutes per day since 2015, the report said. Nearly 62 percent spend more than four hours a day on screen media and 29 percent of users more than eight hours a day according to a report by common sense media a nonprofit organization that helps kids parents and schools navigate media 53 percent of kids have their own smartphone by age 11 and nearly 70 percent have one by age 12. smartphone ownership among tweens increased from 24 percent in 2015 to 41 percent in 2019 and from 67 percent to 84 percent among teens among eight-year-olds, nearly one in five now have their own smartphone. Subjectively speaking, we've noticed a much lower priority on students wanting to get their driver's licenses at age 16. In my high school years, it was a major rite of passage in the event of the sophomore or junior year. My license allowed me to get out of the house on my own terms and connect with people that I wanted to. Now it's not nearly as big of a deal. Is that due to part of the ability to be connected with friends at all times? I don't know, but we see these trends ticking upward. Second, the current digital reality gives us excessive access. We can get any information about anything we want, thanks to Siri, Alexa, and Google. A popular show on Netflix is Stranger Things. You've probably heard of it or watched it yourself. It's a super uh, suspenseful sci-fi mystery story centered on pre-teens in a small town, Indiana. It's masterfully set in the 80s and pays homage to many of the shows and movies that we grew up on. I heard an interview where the creators talked about their desire to write a bit of a love letter to the 80s, but they also said that putting the story in that landscape allowed them to build the mystery so much better because of the technological limitations of the 80s. Photos had to be developed. Communication had to happen on walkie-talkies that could easily go out of range. This is a great example of differences in access during our teen years compared to current access today. Third, the current digital reality emphasizes impersonal communication. Consider the following. Conversations through text messaging are void of nonverbal cues, like body language. Social media posts allow us to filter, edit, and modify our thoughts and even our looks before we send them out. Social media labels connections as friends or followers. 
Even in a video chat, full eye to eye contact is impossible, right? You're either looking at the camera and not into the person's eyes or at the person's eyes and not in the camera, which will take your eyes away from the person. It's wild to think that how convenient that is, there are still things that we're, we're missing. Although the connections we make through technology can be constant, there's a limit to how personal they can be. Fourth, our current digital reality gives us a platform to have immediate reaction. The moment something happens, it's there for the world to see. Not only that, everyone has the opportunity to respond. Unfiltered editorial commentary is everywhere. Personally, I see a twofold implication to this. The first, it's harder than ever to get students to open up and share in youth group. I think this is partly because they're doing too much interpersonal communication, right? Going back to point three. But I also believe because they have become more guarded than ever when it comes to taking risks. On the other hand, we all seem to be battling with deep Christian values like patience, discernment, and contemplation, right? James 1.19 is more important than ever. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I'm sure we could come up with even more ways to define our current digital reality, but I think these points give us a bit of a handle on where we're at, and they point us towards where I hope the rest of our time together will be focused. So what can our response be? In Walt Mueller's great book, Engaging the Soul of Youth Culture, he walks through three church and parental responses to culture around us. The first is alienation. Right, it's this concept that the church is a bunker. In this approach, we live in fear of the world and its effects that they have on our teenagers. We circle the wagons and remove all chances of getting infected by this stuff. Basically, the Amish approach to life. The next approach is accommodation, right? This is the church on a leash concept. In this approach, we just go along with the flow of culture. We, we do not take any of the spiritual implications of our actions or allowances into account. Rather, looking to Christ to define our values and actions, we allow the world to do so. Third is infiltration and transformation. This is the church in the world, but not of the world. This third way is obviously the way that Mueller challenges his readers towards, and I think it's the approach that we should be considering on how we engage in the digital world with our children. We can be tempted to just ban all devices and constantly control our kids' content. And there's a place for this to some extent. We can just get overwhelmed and say kids will be kids on the other end. Although we should never say this, we do have to recognize this stuff isn't going anywhere and that they'll have to and will have to engage with it at some level. Ultimately, we must, in obedience to Christ, become wise consumers ourselves and teach our children to become wise consumers as well. There are two scriptures that will guide us along in this journey of infiltration and transformation. The first is Romans 12 and verse two, which says, "'Do not conform to the pattern of this world, "'but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The next passage is Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 17. It reads, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. I mentioned Steve Job introducing the iPhone towards the beginning of our time together. As things were about ready to wind down, Steve Jobs would say, oh wait, there's one more thing. And that thing was often a big reveal or surprise that people listening didn't know was coming. Well, today, I just wanna say, there's just one more thing. You know, I showed you this common sense media research on uh, screen time for kids. In 2017, common sense media also did research on the parents of these kids. Their findings? Parents of tweens and teenagers spent on average nine hours and 22 minutes on their screen devices. Personal use, not work related, added up to seven hours and 43 minutes. Here's the point. This new digital reality is deeply impacting our lives as much if not more than it is affecting our kids. And we may be struggling to balance it all even more than our children. So let's lead by example. 
And I know that's really difficult, especially during this time, with schools being out of session, not knowing when classes are gonna be starting back up, when you're trying to find something to keep your kids occupied so that you can work and try to get things done around the house, it's easy to hand them a tablet or let them play their game or hop on the screen. And I'm not saying don't do that, but what I am saying is be intentional. Next week, we're gonna dive a little bit into what is out there and how we can best supervise our kids as they engage with this kind of stuff. I hope to see you back next week as we get into that. And be looking for other material that I'm gonna be sending out, this social media and technology survey that you'll be able to do with your children and your spouse at home so that you can be more intentional with how you consume media. Well, as we end today, let's go ahead and have a prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you today and we're grateful. I'm so thankful for the families, the parents who are watching this video and pray a special prayer blessing on those families. Lord, we know we live in an amazing digital reality age today. We know that it can be a blessing, but it can also be a curse. Help us to be intentional and help us to use spiritual insight and wisdom in all of our use. Help us to be good, Christian, mindful consumers with what we have and use those devices, those pieces of technology, uh, those social media apps to spread your word, your love, and your grace. It's in your son's name we pray. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for watching this video and be looking for video two coming out next week. Know that I'm praying for you and your family and know that I hope you have an awesome day.